Welcome to Innovation in Government from the Department of Defense Intelligence Information System Conference, DOTUS 2023 in Portland, Oregon, presented by Kerasoft. I'm your host, Francis Rose. The theme of this conference, the Defense Intelligence Agency hosted, is Chaos to Clarity, Leveraging Emerging Technologies. Over the next hour, you'll meet leaders in government and industry who are at the front lines of data management, artificial intelligence, large language models, and more in the defense, national security, and intelligence communities. Leaders from DIA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and U.S. Special Operations Command will be here. I mentioned DIA hosts this event every year to facilitate discussion among government and industry about emerging technology. One of the top tech topics here is no surprise. DIA has a new artificial intelligence strategy to coordinate how it moves ahead on that technology. At DOTUS 2023, I asked Ramesh Menon, the chief technology officer at DIA, about the intersection of AI and the innovation efforts his agency's making. Ramesh, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me again. Um, using artificial intelligence at DIA, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, broadly though, what's your view on the role that AI and similar technologies can play in the efforts that you're trying to make to innovate at DIA? Thank you for having me, Francis. I believe artificial intelligence is a mega trend. This is gonna continue for decades, and there are multiple areas we believe we can use artificial intelligence from decision support, to decision augmentation, to decision automation for both human machine teaming and machine machine teaming. So we look AI very holistically across our talent and skills, platforms and tools, tradecraft, mission priorities, experimentation, and operationalizing our partnership with our allies for strategic deterrence aligned to our core democratic values as a nation. How are you aligning your strategy, your policy, to that vision of what you want to accomplish with AI and other technologies? So right now we are doing it in a very collaborative manner. We have established a AI community of interest. We have representation from every single J2 COCOM. We have representation from every single Intel Service Center. I also am well connected with the both OSD, DOD, with CDAO and with IC. So I'm also chief AI officer for the agency sitting at the IC level where we collectively make sure we collaborate and avoid duplications and focus on strategic sustainable capability that will give us the decision advantage going forward in an era of strategic competition. What are the roadblocks that your colleagues across the IC and across the DOD community talking to you about as they're experimenting with artificial intelligence and, and looking at use cases to determine if AI is the right fit for solving different problems? E excellent question. I think we need to know our requirements. We need to understand our capabilities we need over long term, and we need to work towards executing those capabilities in a sustainable manner. So it goes across, it's seamless, it is ubiquitous to a certain level. How does it get involved in human resources, within our contracting and procurement process, in helping our analyst, helping our case officer? So it's a human machine teaming scenario, and it will impact every single industry, every single profession, it takes take time, and the technology is accelerating at a very rapid pace. So we have to get ahead and ensure that we can adapt, evolve, and surround this technology in a responsible manner. So I always say we need an explainable and safe AI that complies with the United States Constitution. What does explainable mean in the context of artificial intelligence? To whom do you want to explain it? And what about it do you want to explain? That's a very, very good question and a very foundational question in AI. So if I were to explain in a very simple term, AI is extracting value from data. We have some data. We take this data, create some models, and someone can take those models and create some applications. Those applications are used by our warfighter, by our policy analyst, or by anyone. So if someone says, how did this application give me this answer? How did it infer certain things? You can say, oh, my application used XYZ algorithm. The XYZ algorithm used ABC model. ABC model used these particular data sets. And that's what explainability means. You can go back and forth from lineage, trust, labeling and tagging of data. Is it open source intelligence? Is it synthetic data? Where does the data come from? So really understanding your data and 
integrating it as part of your foundational digital platforms is a core enabler as we operationalize AI within the community. Mm -hmm. Well, what you're getting at there too, I think is a challenge that I've, I've discussed with folks both in the DOD intelligence community and in FedCiv, and that is you've got, it sounds like you've gotten past the challenge of applying artificial intelligence for the sake of artificial intelligence. When you talk about the point of it is extracting data and using that data efficiently, you're getting beyond the technology to what the use case should be. And, and I imagine the point is to get people to think about what those use cases should be. Is that Absolutely, right? Absolutely, right? It's how every function will change and evolve. What does teaming with a machine mean? And that's different for different people. It's different for a HR manager. It's different for a contracting officer. It's very different for someone else trying to read 10,000 documents and make sense of it into a two-page summary for Secretary of Defense or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you're right. Ultimately, we have to look from a functional perspective. What is the future operating model? How do we leverage data and digital platforms to get the strategic intelligence advantage we need as a nation. How will you know at some future point, whenever that may be, that the strategy that you've laid out for artificial intelligence for DIA and more broadly for the IC is achieving what you want it to achieve? Or how will you know, maybe we need to revisit either what we want to achieve strategically or the way that we're executing or implementing that strategy? That's a excellent question. So any strategy we should be able to measure, what are the performance measures, effectiveness measures, and in this case, we are looking at a maturity model. So we baseline our current maturity and then slowly evolve that maturity across the five or six pillars we track. So it's a very consistent and we are all measuring the maturity against the same scale. And that's something I see is currently working as we try to standardize the AI maturity model and the framework for measuring AI maturity. And that would be one of the ways we plan to establish a centralized governance framework enabling federated execution. I obviously don't expect specifics given that it's the intelligence community, but have there been situations where you and some of your peers have, have maybe wanted to go in different directions on some aspects of either the strategy or the tactical? And how does one navigate those differences of opinion about something when a technology like AI is still as nascent as it is? Interestingly, we all work very well as a team. We complement each other. I'm extremely thankful to my colleagues from intelligence community, from other agencies. And we actually work well. We communicate regularly. We complement each other. We do joint submissions to DNI on what we should be doing as a nation. So I think there is strong concurrence and agreement where we collectively are going as a community. Ramesh, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for your time. Ramesh Menon of DIA at DOTUS 2023. One of the leaders of the modernization effort U.S. Special Operations Command is working on is its chief information officer, Joe Tregakis. I asked him what that effort encompasses and what he wants it to look like as it continues. Joe Tregakis, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me. You're leading modernization efforts at SOCOM. Tell me about what you're doing there and what you want it to look like when you work through the process. Yeah, first off, I'd, Francis, thanks for the opportunity. I would tell you that I don't think I'm leading them. I'm certainly part of the apparatus that is that is that is leading them, and you know, certainly in line with the General Fenton's priorities of, of people win transform, and kind of the partnership with with the CIO, the CDAO, you know, AT and L, our components, and our our T socks. And so, just to to try to put that in in, in perspective, and and really with the the CG's goals of uh, aligned with the CG's priorities of people win and, and transform. And so on the on the J6 side of the house, Francis, we're, we're, we're doing really a lot to try to modernize the environment and, and really to, to, to modernize it, we first have to identify where we've got some technical debt. And so, you know, my, my shop right now is leading an effort to really try to identify all the different systems running on our, you know, the eight or 10 different networks that we have within the command. Uh, we're, we're looking at those systems to see, you know, what's the status of an ATO, uh, what kind of funding is tied to the program, you know, who, who owns the program, you know, is there an API that, that's part of the system that allows the CDAO to pull data from to, to make it actionable and, and useful type of data. And if, if the answer to those questions is, is no, then we're really trying to take a hard look at what are we trying to do to get to yes. Uh, and if not, you know, how do we sunset that that particular system? Uh, you know, certainly there are 
critical requirements to have those systems in place. And so then how do we develop a system that does, you know, have the ATO, have the funding, and then have an API that we can we can lead. So mm -hmm. it sounds like you have some of the building blocks though in place to get to the vision that you and your colleagues have long term. We do. We, um, you know, I, I think the, the processes that exist within the command between a data governance board, you know, chaired by the vice commander and, and certainly our, our, our validation process of requirements. Uh, you know, I try to meet frequently with the ATNL director or her uh, program executive officers or the CDAO just, you know, and certainly with, with components and TSOCs just so that we can kind of lay out the strategy, you know, with a, with a, with a CIO vision and, and ensure that we're aligned with the, the commander's you know, priorities as well. What's your sense of the technical debt that you have and that you want to retire in order to get to that modernization vision? I, I think it's massive. Um, I think that really, you know, probably 95% of my people's time and, and my budget um, really is maintaining you know, the existing systems that we have, you know, much of which, you know, has got quite a bit of technical debt associated with it. And so the only way we can free up the capacity and free up the dollars to get at kind of some of the modernization efforts is to identify that. You know, I'll steal a phrase from one of our component sixes, uh, you know, of, of, of frustration with fielding, you know, yesterday's technology tomorrow, you know, just based on the fact that we've got to do so much uh, and invest so much in maintaining those those legacy systems. As you're doing that modernization effort, what opportunities do you have to look at processes to decide maybe there are things that you do that you don't need to do anymore and, or things that you can automate, processes that are manual, those kinds of things? I, I, there's a lot of that. Uh, you know, we've, we've the last couple of years, we've gone through a pretty significant uh, network consolidation effort, you know, you know, consolidating, you know, nipper nets down to one as opposed to, you know, 10 years ago, we probably had 10 or 12 different Nippernet environments. You know, our, our secret in enclaves down to two, which years ago was was a factor of 10. Uh, you know, even into our SAP networks and, and doing a, a lot of, you know, consolidate first, you know, gain some efficiencies through that, you know, you know get everyone to a, a more common common standard. You're appearing here at, uh, at DOTUS. What do you want people to take away from the remarks that you'll make? So I, I sat in a panel yesterday, really just talking through some of the, you know, the unique challenges we have, some of the, you know, innovations that we, you know, we have. I, I think for us, it's, you know, we've, we've got service components, uh, you know, soft components, you know, embedded with, with services. And then, you know, we, we don't command and control anything forward, right? Ultimately, we are, you know, our customer is the, the geographic combatant commands and, and so, you know, as we look across the globe, we've got to stay aligned with each each one of those, with, with the CG's priorities, you know, to ensure that the, the system, the kits that we're deploying, fielding, are, are aligned with Joint Fires Network, you know, or other, you know, you know, SOC Pack is a, you know, certainly a boss top priority right now. And, and so a lot of our effort right now is, is going towards, you know, getting at their requirements. One, you mentioned kits. One of them that I know is important is a modernized tactical kit environment. Tell me what that is and, and what that means. So to me, that 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 really is a you know what we call a, a tactical mission environment or network, um, and 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 that's really just trying to you know and as a as a comm planner, you know I, I I'm responsible for the tactical kit through the you know the most sensitive networks you know as, with my CIO role, and so really tactical mission networks you know is part of the pace plan, the priority, the alternative, the contingency, the emergency type communications plan. Ideally, we're we're deploying into these environments with with approved type one type systems. Uh, a lot of our you know uh, partners have, have got the budgets to be able to afford that type of kit, but but many don't. And so what this tactical mission environment does is is kind of give us a, a a commercially securable you know something we can spin up on demand, something that we can tear down on demand, where we're confident, you know, we're working with our IC partners to make sure that the communications are secure. I mean, at the end of the day, when you look at where our soft teams are deploying, you know, 85 to 90 percent of the time that they're on the ground, you know, they're not in a tactical environment, right? They don't have weapons, they don't have body armor, they don't have helmets, they don't have type one radios. They're, you know, they're living amongst the, you know, the, the, the citizens of that region, you know, the, their, their, their partners within that region, you know, and at the end, they're on commercial type devices. And so how do we take, you know, AES level encryption, you know, to at least ensure that those communications are, you know, secure to that, you know, to that level. And, and when the engagement's done, you maintain the communications link to maintain that relationship with a partner, 
or in the case of, you know, if you're not going to go back, you, you just tear it down and you, you, you archive the data, learn something from it, and, and go on to the next ridge line. Joe Tregakis, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you, Francis. Appreciate your time. Joe Tregakis, the CIO at SOCOM at DOTUS 2023. AI experts call data the oil that fuels artificial intelligence. At DOTUS 2023, I asked Michael St. Cross, Senior Director of Federal at Beyond Trust, how he sees organizations in the national security and intelligence spaces moving data securely. Michael, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me here. Um, what do you see uh, these, the government organizations that are here wrestling with when it comes to moving data back and forth and using that data, doing that all in a secure environment? Well, a great question. Uh, you know, at Beyond Trust, from our perspective, Security, uh, Beyond Trust is really focused on protecting information and really protecting the access of the information. So the most important thing in securing and moving data for the defense intelligence mission really is protecting privileged access as you know, well as human entity privileged access and non-human entity privileged access. Because that is the key compromise that Nation states, our, our adversaries are looking to compromise. As we see in the public breaches that have been disclosed recently, uh, most importantly, the Okta identity provider breach where super admin privileges have been stolen at the browser level, enabling uh, a service provider, a third party, to start looking into your data. And this is cloud-centric, but the same threat factor of cloud security with uh, the Office 365 compromise of the Microsoft Azure environment that's impacted the federal government. It, we're consistently seeing the same patterns, even with the uh, MGM casino breach, same tools, same tactics, techniques, and procedures. So as security people, we're concerned about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of mission data. Confidentiality makes sense. You know, the adversary wants to breach the data. It could be a malicious insider, could still be an, an external attack vector, but the external for the defense community is, is maybe minimizing. The internal is, is rising. And as we go to uh, cloud, we're creating more threat vectors, more access points. And it's interesting because I really want to compromise the confidentiality of mission data, uh, but I can't do that as easily because things like zero trust, zero trust identity controls are being implemented. So in terms of challenges, it's really that privilege access, but in terms of the what can we do? What, you know, what's the next step? It really is implementing zero trust identity controls. With, with the principles that have been laid out by the, the, the DOD program office, we're really looking at, we wanna do one thing to cause another. It's all you know, cause and effect. So if we impact the availability of data, right? you mentioned the uh, moving of huge volumes of data. So if I can compromise that availability, uh, that might give me a new opportunity to compromise the confidentiality because I may go off a secure government network onto a commercially available network that might be controlled by a nation state. So, you know, the sources and methods are always the thing we want to protect, but, you know, there's just some capped and obvious things that are uh, going on. And then even the integrity of the data set as data is moving to uh, AI and machine learning based models. As a malicious insider, if I can influence the model to get a bad outcome, compromising the integrity, uh, I want to do that too. So, you know, mission intelligence decisions are, are off, and that gives, again, our adversary an advantage. But it still comes back to, I have this fundamental of the attack vector, which is the MITRE attack model number six, which is privilege escalation. That's where we're still not doing the best at eliminating that threat. So uh, at Beyond Trust, we have a point of view. Uh, we wanna get you out of that uh, administrator risk and really giving just-in-time privilege, no standing privilege, uh, expiration of unused privilege, revoking it so it's not available in memory, uh, as well as breaking away from uh, endpoint risks with application whitelisting. So local admin threats, uh, excessive shadow admin threats are eliminated because that's no longer supporting the model. And I think those are some key things to think about implementing in the zero trust activities that the DOD's laid out for not only the agencies, but the mission partners as well.
Michael St. Cross, it's great to see you. Thanks very much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. Michael St. Cross of Beyond Trust. More powerful computing underlies all the infrastructure that drives tech like AI and data management. I asked Gina Sinta, the Deputy Chief Technology Officer at Talus Trusted Cyber Technologies, about the opportunities she sees for NatSec and IC operators for quantum computing. Gina Sinta of Talus Trusted Cyber Technologies, great to see you. Thanks for joining me, Gina. Happy to be here. Um, you're talking at this conference about quantum computing. What's the opportunity that the people that are here in the defense community, the intelligence community, NATSEC community, what's the opportunity that they have and will have as quantum computing becomes more prominent? Sure. I think there's two sides of it. There's the, the advantage of the quantum computing to be able to accelerate analysis and get an answer to a question faster than you might be able to with traditional computing. Um, but there's the threat of quantum computers to breaking PKI that is the other aspect that we have to keep in mind. Yeah. Is there, well, I'll ask you it a different way. I think there's a perception at least that quantum computing is just doing what we're doing now faster or doing more of it. Is there more to it than that? Or is it really that simple, Gina? Yeah, I think it's that it's pretty simple that it's going to accelerate processing. It's not like everybody's going to have a quantum computer at their desk. Yes. It's going to be more um, accessible through cloud services because it's going to be too expensive and too um, massive to manage on your own. Yeah. And everybody's moving to the cloud anyway. So leveraging it from a cloud service provider is just a part going to be another part of their business aspect. You mentioned that potential downside or maybe even dark side of right. quantum computing. Who needs to do what to avoid that, to make sure that that doesn't happen or that it's mitigated at least to the extent that it can be? Right. So you really need to start working on it now because although we don't know when there's going to be a quantum computer that's going to be powerful enough to break um, asymmetric encryption, you need to be ready. And um, so that's our messaging to, that we talk to everybody about is preparing You've got to do um, inventory of your crypto so that you know where it's at and then start working with technology partners out in the industry that have solutions that are already implementing, you know, the pre-certified uh, algorithms in their products. So you can start seeing how it might affect your applications and your integrations that you that leverage that. Do we have a sense yet of what the long view is in quantum computing? Is it in the national security space? Is it a race the way that a lot of other technolo technological breakthroughs have been over the years where we're trying to be faster or bigger or whatever than our potential strategic competitors? Or it, could this be different because yeah, of the, the nature of technology? Is, the race is on, but yeah. it's really with our adversaries, yeah. right? Um, because they're going to leverage it for the bad, not for the good, right? So we're looking at our government's looking at how they can leverage it for good, but they also need to protect against the threat. Right. Um, and so there's other you know, countries out there that are building quantum computers as well that um, we don't know how far along they are compared to how far along you know, somebody like an IBM is. Um, so we have to be aware of that and be prepared so that we can't um, you know, we mitigate that risk when it does happen. And there's no end date to that. Right. It's all estimated. Right. Yeah. It could be 2027, 2030 or the numbers the years that I hear people estimating where there's a computer that's going to be powerful enough to break asymmetric encryption. How does one know that one is on the right track regarding all of the things that you've described in this conversation that people need to try to stay out in front of? Well, so I think that inventory of your um, crypto, working with your um, technology partners that provide that. Um, we're also participating in a project at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence on the migration to post-quantum um, crypto. And it's a global um, consortium of technology partners and government uh, as well um, that are uh, putting together plans for how you can mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. There's uh, right now we're working on two different um, what they call work streams. There's one for um, the discovery of where your crypto is. Um, and then the second one is interoperability and performance related to how are these um, more sophisticated algorithms going to perform and affect you know, your, your applications. Um, and as a matter of fact, those uh, volumes of uh, materials, artifacts, are, should be coming out soon for a comment 
um, from NCCOE, so keep an eye on their website because they're really great at posting their uh, artifacts and ask for public comment. Gina, thanks very much for joining me. It's great yeah, to see you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Listen at FedGovToday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is pivoting. At FedGov Today's coverage of NGA's GeoInt conference last summer, you learned about a virtualization effort the agency was starting. Here at DOTUS, I asked Mark Chatelaine, the chief information officer at NGA, for a progress report. Mark, it's great to see you again. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, when we were together in St. Louis, you talked about a virtualization project that you've undertaken at NGA. Where does that stand now? What progress uh, have you are you able to talk about since the last time we got together? So we've had a kind of a shift uh, change in where we're going with our virtualization. We thought we could virtualize all of our analyst exploitation workstations. Um, what it would do is enable the analyst to be free from their desktop device and be able to move around the building and things like that. But you have to take a look at performance for the analyst. You have to take a look at cost of the devices. It turns out that the thick clients that the analysts use today, which are kind of cumbersome, technology has really advanced since we bought these probably five years ago. So technology advanced, the prices come down. So the thin clients offer less performant capabilities and um, about the same cost as the thick client. And so we've made a decision to move away from our virtualization, at least for our analyst workstations, the ones that they exploit imagery on. And uh, we're gonna give them what they really want is a performant workstation sitting underneath their desk. And so it's been a change in heart. And again, a lot of people have to kind of give up their, their passion for wanting to move forward with those thin clients. But uh, again, we've got to give the analysts something they can do their job. And that's the most important thing to me. Interesting focus, though, because it's something that maybe five, certainly 10 years ago in the government broadly wouldn't have happened. It sounds like you're reflecting the kind of the same customer experience and user experience uh, data that you're collecting that a lot of organizations, not just in the IC, but across government are. You ask your people what they wanted. And they told you, and it wasn't necessarily what you thought they wanted or what you thought would be best for them. Exactly. That's exactly a very good point. And, and again, the bottom line is, is we have the flexibility to change in the future if we need to. Um, John Sherman pointed out today in his speech that he did here that we have got to manage our tech refresh as if it's really important because we can't let our technology age. In our, uh, our video teleconference room that we have back in Springfield, um, we have technology that's 10 years old. It's amazing how horrible monitors look that are 10 years old. You don't have 4K ultra high definition. So we're fixing that next month. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were together in St. Louis over the summer, uh, you also talked about what you were learning about generative AI and the potential implications from a cybersecurity perspective of generative AI. What are you seeing in the six months or so that you've had a chance to really eyeball that issue, Mark? So I'm gonna answer that as two different questions. Okay. So generative AI will impact cybersecurity. So we can use generative AI to help us ferret out different cybersecurity issues and problems. You can run things fast, you can train models and things like that. So in one respect, generative AI is so critical to us fighting that cyber battle. Flip it around, generative AI can be a huge problem from a cybersecurity standpoint as well, because it can give our adversaries the ability to, um, to be able to attack us basically in ways that we would have never imagined. And so uh, we're beginning to take a look at that. Uh, we're beginning to find out the way that we can use generative AI according to our ethical principles within the agency, but also be aware of what our adversaries are doing to be able to uh, uh, put up an attack front. What aspects, what pieces of artificial intelligence, especially generative AI, does one need to protect? Is it just protecting the algos? Is it protecting the infrastructure? All of the above, something else? Are we not sure yet maybe because of, the, uh, of how new the technology is? So we have a good idea of what we need to protect as far as what we're doing. Uh, we have got to protect our systems. And that's one of the things that presidential order NSM-8, it's a zero trust order, has basically focused us on is how we protect the data. So even if we have somebody that comes into our network using generative AI, they cannot traverse our network because every piece of data is protected right down to the individual users that only have access to it. And so, 
I read about work that you're doing on something called JREN, and I tried to write a little bit of a synopsis, and I thought, that doesn't make any sense. You're the expert. Tell me what JREN is. Tell me what you're doing with it. JREN is our joint regional edge node. And again, what it does is it puts a compute and application capability as well as data out to our combatant commands. So in about the last year, what we've done is we've actually prototyped a joint regional edge node or JREN at US Indopaycom. They actually set the system up. They've used it to do some exercises out there. The command was extremely happy. And what it does is it, base, it, it enables us to provide capabilities in a denied, degraded, or disrupted environment. If you cut off the comm systems, what are they gonna do? They can't reach back to our data centers to pull data. So they need to have that data right there. It needs to be as fresh as possible. And so that's what our JRENs are going to do. We have plans of putting four JRENs out into the community. Uh, when uh, Mr. Sherman was on FedGov today uh, from this conference talking about edge computing, it sounds like what you're, the, he's moving toward is Edge being able to communicate with Edge, and it sounds like JREN will facilitate that. Is that a fair read on my That's part? That's exactly right. So JREN is something that NGA is doing, and there's a number of different Edge capabilities. Uh, Honorable Sherman mentioned something called Joe, which is the yes. Joint Operational Edge. And again, that's just another version of exactly what we're doing. But the goal is to get that computational and data as close to the tactical front as we possibly can. What does one do to secure an environment like that that may be separated from the broader network? So you put the same security provisions, you overlay that on top of everything that runs, whether it's the data, the applications, or the networks, will all be encrypted. They will all basically operate at the same as our data centers at our Springfield location or actually in the cloud. We have about a minute left, Mark. Uh, you spoke recently at NGA's Industry Strategy Summit. What did you want to convey to your partners in industry there? So my major point of uh, discussion at the Industry Summit was introducing something called the Program Executive Office or PEO structure for NGA. NGA has been under, um, I don't want to call it scrutiny, but the oversight has really looked at us saying, you know, we need to understand your acquisition processes because they're different than what the Army or the Navy or the Air Force does. And so the, um, the PEO structure is going to make us look like the Army, the Navy from an acquisition standpoint. Oversight is going to appreciate that as well because our budget will be aligned to our programs. We will have solid defined programs that make sense to our oversight. And so it's not gonna be a big change for me because we've been doing things that way. It's what we call things or what we name things. Mark Chatelaine, great to see you again. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate the opportunity. Mark Chatelaine, the CIO at NGA. Innovations become a focal point of change in the defense and intelligence communities. But industry leaders say those communities can be averse to change. I asked Jeff Deal, District Manager for National Security for F5, how he's seen people break through that culture. Jeff Deal, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me. Um, we talked a little bit before we turned the recorder on, cameras on. Um, the DOD community is not as receptive as maybe it could be about innovation. You've been in this space for a while. What have you seen people do to drive innovation in an organization like the Defense Department where innovation is not always well received? Right, yeah, well, so it's interesting, right? I've, I've, uh, I've got a few decades of experience working with, with a lot of the customers here and some of that uh, spans through um, larger companies, right, that are well known for what they do. Some of that has to do with a little bit of history in the startup space. And uh, the, you know, our customers are uh, and sometimes burdened with a lot of process. So, you know, one of the one of the best ways to find a kind of a shortcut through that is to find some uh, pain or demand around an area of interest, whether it's a, a mission program or mission objective to try to, you know, help them understand better efficiencies and new technologies and ways to address that. Um, so I've seen the customers be successful in NQTEL engagements, as an example. Uh, I've seen uh, customers with some uh, some better experience operating with uh, cloud marketplaces as an example and and we've experienced some of that our customers have benefited from some of that in the company that i work for today so there's there's a couple of different ideas there but at the end of the, at the end of the day the the faster path to helping the 
the community innovate is through those pain points and some of those mission objectives. Yeah, finding a demand signal, I imagine, is not too hard. I imagine you've seen episodes over time where there are pain points where the person experiencing the pain might not know that it's that there's a better solution or might not know that they can ameliorate that pain somehow. Yeah, I, I mean, it, you're, you're spot on. Uh, awareness of, of new and evolving technologies is always a challenge. And so, you know, we have, we have sales teams and systems engineers that are constantly working with uh, our partners, systems integrator partners, um, partnering with our, our direct customers on the USG side uh, to keep that awareness uh, as tight as possible. So they understand, you know, if we're, if we're making an acquisition around application delivery, why are we doing that? And how are they gonna be able to benefit that? And uh, naturally we wanna grow our target addressable market as a company, but for the customer, it gives them some ability to leverage our technology in spaces where they might not be thinking about it. What's the trend that you've seen over time for DOD, the intelligence community, the national defense sector more broadly, at being able to express to their industry partners, this is what we're going for, or this is the problem that we have, rather than bringing you a big textbook style book of requirements and asking you to check all the boxes? Right, yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, you know, some of that is, um, you know, uh, more blatantly uh, um, available than, uh, than other ideas, like, you know, security threats and vulnerabilities, right? Sometimes the, uh, the next innovation is around protecting a vulnerability or a risk for, for a customer. You can point to any number of open source vulnerabilities that have taken place in the sector in the last, you know, three to five years. Well, part of the challenge there is it's a shiny object syndrome. As soon as there is a open source vulnerability, the IT security sector is going to tell you every way that they can think of to solve that. So I, I think it's incumbent upon us to go and demonstrate to our government customers how we're efficiently or more efficiently or effectively addressing some of those, those issues, right? I think that's a, a big part of it. You answered ask half of the next question I was going to ask, which is how can industry be a better partner to government? You covered that. How can government be a better partner to industry? And by that same measure then, get the solutions that they need in a yeah. more easy, faster, maybe cheaper way? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, conferences like this, the DOTUS conference is a great environment for us to be at. Um, network, uh, infrastructure, cybersecurity, uh, this, this tends to be a, uh, a different type of an agenda for us, uh, more relevant for the technology that we're trying to, to get out into that space. The other thing that becomes a little bit of a challenge is every um, agency has a different personality or, or complexion and how they build their infrastructures. Uh, some of those, as an example, have a service provider mindset. And so uh, that's a more consolidated approach to advertising their strategy and their go forward direction. Other organizations have uh, different types of stovepipes around programs that they stand up for cybersecurity or infrastructure. Some of those tend to overlap. And then of course, you've got the special uh, programs that are out there that have uh, pretty unique security requirements. And, and so, it, you know, I think that if I were to make a recommendation, it would be great if the government could, uh, you know, hold a conference that basically said, here's our strategic objectives by agency and where we intend to invest each fiscal year. I think that would be a, a great step forward. Jeff, thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Listen at fedgovtoday.com and everywhere you get your shows. Don't miss out on the conversation. Follow the podcast today. Welcome back to Innovation in Government. I mentioned data as the fuel for artificial intelligence earlier in the program. The intelligence community recognizes that through its IC data strategy. Lori Wade is the chief data officer at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. I asked her to describe the development, implementation, and execution of that data strategy. Lori, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for joining me today. Um, what, tell me about the uh, development, implementation, execution of the data strategy in the IC. Great, uh, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, excited to talk about my favorite topic, which is uh, data and the IC data strategy. Uh, released earlier this year, as you know, it's unclassified, which is why we we're able to sit here and talk about this. That was by design. There's not a classified version. The idea was to bring the 18 elements of the IC together to look at where we are on our data journey, 
We are a data organization, the intelligence community, and we need to get to a place where we're planning for that data and make that data available as quickly as can for exploitation and use, discoverability and interoperability. And so the data strategy really brings the four critical focus areas that we need to get done in the next several years. You'll notice on the strategy, it also has to 2025, which when we were doing the strategy, a lot of people thought that's a typo because in the federal government and the intelligence community, we normally work across fiscal years that span five. And so I said, no, we don't have time for that. What we're gonna do is take this to 2025 and then we will look at what happens 26 and out. So I stood up a data future group to be looking at the strategy out. On the four focus areas in this strategy, we came together with one year implementation plans that all 18 agencies have signed up to. We just completed the first year of those actions and now we're working on uh, what will happen in this next year as far as what actions will we take, how will we be measuring, and then how we're gonna progress against the four. You didn't have time, why? Because of the threat landscape, because of the technological evolution the government and the IC in particular are undertaking, some other reason, some combination of those? I think it's a, a combination of all of the above. I'm not new to the intelligence community. I've been in for a long time. I came in already knowing what we needed to do. <laughs> I'd been part of the CDO community in the IC. So I, I felt like I was very focused on, we need to be very deliberate and intentional about this planning around these areas and move the needle forward on them. You know, a lot because of the driving uh, emerging technology, it's no longer about the volume of data that we have, but the capabilities. We hear a lot about AI, I love it. We need to embrace it, but we need to embrace it from what we need to do. What are the foundational elements that are gonna get us there to where we can implement that at scale and benefit the, the mission end user uh, with all of the data that we have. And so I felt that, uh, you know, also the near peer adversary uh, threats that we face, everything that's going on, the data is so core and central. And if we don't attack these areas and make sure that we're doing that now, it'll set us on a path that will delay our ability to fully embrace and implement and use our data and AI at speed and scale. You mentioned the four areas of the strategy and I read they are performing end-to-end -end data management, delivering data interoperability and analytics at speed and scale, advancing all partnerships for continued digital and data innovation and transforming the IC workforce to be data-driven. I wanna start with that third one, advancing all partnerships for continued digital and data innovation. Partnerships has been a big theme of this conference uh, throughout all of the conversations that I've had with government and industry. What are the important critical partners for the data community inside the IC, either internally or externally? It's a great question. This is something that it's, uh, for this conference, certainly, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, um, uh, DNI, has put into the national intelligence strategy. Partnership is key. It's definitely key on this front because we have to look and see how the world, how our the private sector, our partners who are here this week, our DOD colleagues, our, our liaison partners, our academic partners are all evolving how they're thinking about data and how data in, is innovating and especially how critical it is to AI, generative AI, large language models, there's a lot of advancement that happens that we've not caught up with. And the partnership is gonna be key. It's gonna be the collective of the IC members, the IC CDO community, also working with what I like to call the digital C-suite, the IC CDOs, C CIOs, and CISOs, because you have to have the zero trust architecture. All of those things have to come together as a collective. And I talk a lot in the first one, the first focus area on end-to-end -end data management. If we look at from the point of collection all the way through to exploitation and dissemination, all of those factors have to be considered. And how we're doing it today, we're successful, but in this, as we advance forward and just the volumes, we, the status quo can no longer maintain, and it's gonna take a collective view from all of those uh, contributors, right? All the great uh, exhibitors that we have here at DOTUS this week, is vitally important that we bring them into the discussion and not just think of them, the private sector as vendors, but bring them in as a true partnership. And we've, we've kicked off several programs this last year, working with them to think about 
different topics. I call it the Future Now series. And we implemented that recently, brought the private sector and the intelligence community officers together to look at the three horizons of the future of emerging and immersive technologies and what the impact of national security is and what do we need to do now to optimize for that future? We just have a minute or so left, Lori. What do you and what do your colleagues across the intelligence community need to do to transform the workforce, to be data-driven, and how will you know when you've achieved that goal? I think it's gonna be vitally important to continue to elevate the role of the chief data officer, bring them to the decision-making table on all decisions because there are real implications to how we do our budgets, how we use our data, storage and compute. These are factors that leading any large organization, how we use our data is gonna be vitally important. And having a workforce, not just from the mission and the collection and how to use that data for intelligence, but we need to learn, we need to bring the workforce along to see this is how we work with data. And it's not just literacy and uh, acumen, but also tradecraft. It's that di digital and data tradecraft that we need to be able to operate as a data organization in the world today and in the future. Lori, it's great to see you. Thanks very much great. for your time. Thank you. Today. Appreciate it. Thanks. Lori Wade, the Chief Data Officer at ODNI, the attendees here at DOTUS 2023 from government and industry, weren't just trying to solve the problems they see today. On the stages and in the aisles, a lot of the conversation revolved around what's ahead. I asked John Veal, Government Vice President for Defense and Intelligence at Cloudera, how he sees emerging technologies shaping the future of the intelligence and national security communities. John, welcome. It's great to see you. Thanks for doing this. How do you see things like AI, machine learning, some of the other cutting edge technologies that we're talking about at this show, really driving the future of defense intelligence and, and the IC community broadly? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Is, uh, is you know, given the advancements in, in the emerging tech, things like generative AI, et cetera, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are asking that, right? How can we best adopt this to benefit our country, our, our service members and uh, everyone uh, as a whole, right? Uh, I think it's gonna be really important for, for uh, agencies as they adopt this technology to understand that that it's it's changing it's it's morphing over time right and so however we want to go solve these problems adopting this right uh, we have to make sure that whatever we're choosing to to uh, to, to go after these mission really important mission sets uh, needs to be open needs to be extensible needs to be future proofed right uh, the worst thing you want to do is adopt a new technology that then creates another silo for you to be stuck in for the next, you know, the remaining uh, several years, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so I think that's, that's one of the most important things uh, uh, to consider while we're having these discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think it's very, very exciting that, uh, you know, people are interested in how we can adopt these to make uh, everyone's lives easier, um, uh, maintain information dominance, uh, you know, and, and solve these really complex problems that we've been trying to solve for a very long time. So, so it's really an exciting time. I think there's there's a lot of questions out there, and I think as we adopt this and, and start to put these into production, uh, it's uh, it's going to be really important to to make sure that our eyes are on the future. You say there are a lot of questions out there. What are the questions that the DoD folks, the IC folks, and so on that you're talking to are asking? And what are the questions maybe that they should be asking that they're not? Yeah. So uh, at Cloudera, we have a lot of discussions around this. And, and I think one of the things that we're noticing coming up is, is uh, you know, our, our customers are, are asking for ways uh, and specific problems. They can, they can go implement the tools they already have, uh, uh, you know, using these, these uh, you know, AI technology, Gen AI, machine learning, et cetera. Um, what are the use cases they can go address, right? Uh, and, and we're glad to provide some of the, the past performance and, and ways we're working with, with customers, both in, both in the private and pu public sector, uh, on, on how they're using that. Um, you know, in terms of what, what we think uh, the question should be asked, right? Uh, it really comes down to, uh, you know, the, the open standards based, right? Uh, you know, and I mentioned it previously, 
What you don't want to do is is standardize on a technology that's going to stovepipe you. Um, you know, I think being able to uh, select something that has the flexibility to operate in multiple different types of environments, right? Um, you know, one constant is change in our world, right? And and uh, you know, whether it's running in a cloud, whether it's running on prem, whether it's running in in all of those at the same time, uh, I think whatever use cases we're deciding to solve needs to have that, uh, that sort of open, uh, we need to be asking how is it going to be able to future-proof, uh, you know, what we're going to do the next year or the year after. Yeah, and that's kind of where I wanted to go next. What is over the horizon or is it even possible to try to predict or, or game out what's over the horizon when a technology is still as new uh, and, and still as uh, there's still so many questions as you talked about with something like AI, something like machine learning. Well, you know, when you look at, at, at sort of the White House's um, uh, directive or EO around the ethical principles around this, right? Um, I think that is a, is a defining criteria of, of how we need to approach this for the future, right? Uh, and use that as sort of a, uh, a mechanism to help decipher what is next, right? Um, if you look at the evolution and how quickly we got to, you know, the advent of chat GPT and, and the next, um, you know, uh, iteration of that is going to be dealing with video, right? Um, you know, I, I think it's it's really, really important to use that as sort of the, the, the beacon of, of where we need to go and predict trusting that those, uh, you know, those ideals set forth in that are, are going to govern sort of what is next, right? Um, I think the most encouraging thing that you've said is that the department and the IC seem to be focused on use cases and not on the technology itself. Is that something that I should draw the in encouragement from that I seem to? A absolutely, uh, and, and I think it's a great thing, right? Because you know, technology is only valuable when you know specifically what you're going to try and solve, right? Uh, and I think uh, you know the DoD and the intelligence community have done a great job at uh, shifting over the, the past five to ten years on on changing from a focus on the actual tech and what the tech delivers to how is it going to help solve our mission, right? Uh, and, and we at Cloud are excited to see that um, because I think that's really where industry can help in in telling the story as to how this truly can contribute to our nation's success. John, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you, it's great being here. John Veal of Cloudera at DOTUS 2023, that future focus on AI and machine learning isn't limited to the defense and intel communities. Those technologies will drive the partnerships too that a lot of vendors and government leaders discussed here. I asked Tony Hadfield, Vice President of Solutions Architecture at Venify, what he sees on the horizon. Tony, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to do it. Um, what do you see on the horizon for the people in this room, NAT Security, Intel, DOD folks, regarding artificial intelligence and machine learning? A lot of people talk about AI, not machine learning as much. So what do you see on the horizon for those folks? Yeah, it's it's interesting how you know fast things can move now, right? So one of the areas that we look at pretty closely is, is generated code. Right? So as you think about how fast now someone can have code that will run in a spreadsheet as a macro or uh, you know, automate tasks that they're doing on a regular basis that didn't have the capabilities to do that. Now, really looking at what is authorized code to run, how do you authorize it, when is it allowed to run? Uh, those are one area where we uh, spend a lot of time of not only looking at how to do that, but how you scale that, right? So. Um, if you look at machine learning in general, you know, one of the challenges is, um, you know, what type of information are you feeding it? Um, you know, if you, as you look at it today, it's more of, uh, you know, kind of synthesizing and regurgitating things we know. But as it improves, it's going to be able to start doing things that we haven't thought of yet. And I think that's, that's where the real danger of, of how do I know whether I trust something or not trust uh, will come into play, right? And so it's it's no longer okay to be on the sidelines and look at AI as, oh, well, you know, we'll be a little bit more effective, but really what impacts is it having across the business? 
Is the challenge deploying the technology itself or is the challenge deploying it at scale? Or maybe the correct answer is yes. <laughs> well, I, it's one of those things that y yes to both, right? Yeah. It's, it's also something that even if you aren't using AI as a technology, it's something you have to be aware of, right? Because of that scale, right? So it, it could be used for good and it can be used for bad as well, right? So if you're, you're not incorporating it within your business um, because it's not something you're ready to take on, does not mean that, you know, uh, bad actors aren't using AI and technology to uh, understand your business, right? Uh, if you look at the recent, um, issue that they had at uh, OpenAI where they were, what happened was they were feeding it the same word over and over. And basically what it looked like was a buffer overflow. And it was basically feeding out information that you wouldn't necessarily want mm -hmm. people to have, right? So being able to, to understand not only what your information you may have in there and have exposed, as well as you know individual people within an organization that may be using ai what are your policies what is what are you actually feeding it right because because you don't own that data the ai companies in most cases own what you're feeding it so uh, there's a lot of risk there to really understand how that's being used what's your sense of how organizations in national security national defense intelligence and so on are doing at using ai and machine learning as tools to solve problems rather than using them as solutions in search of a problem. You understand what I mean? Right. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, you know, I think we've given it a, a new name and I think it's only because it's it's moving faster, right? But if you look at, um, you know, like breach detection, AI has been, you know, something that's there, right? Machine learning is there, right? It's, it's way too much data for a person to sit and log and go through. So having to be able to surface important things Right, it, you know, the creativity and, and uh, the ability to react to some of these things is still gonna be humans for a long time, right? But surfacing information, making people more powerful is really, uh, you know, the critical piece of, of how we can look at uh, machine learning and AI and how it's impacting businesses. What, look, what does success look like at some future point, whether it's a short-term year or so, or long-term 10 years? And I understand 10 years from now, we have no idea where the technology itself will be. Yeah. But what does success look like, do you think, from a governance perspective and a management perspective? You know, it's interesting at, at, at Venify, we manage, you know, keys and certificates. Uh, and, and that's one of the things we do with, uh, and really we call it machine identity management. And as part of that, um, you know, we have customers that worry about, you know, breaches and outages of, of systems. What we use it for is, is to enable people to faster onboard their systems, understand. So we incorporate uh, AI to really help them understand how they can move a lot faster, right? And that's, that's really where AI shines, right? So whether it's, um, you know, kind of looking at its standard business practices or, or tackling something for the first time, it's really getting people to, to be able to react faster. Tony, it's great to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Tony Hadfield of Venify, thanks very much for joining me for this Innovation in Government program from DOTUS 2023 presented by Kerasoft. If you missed any part of this program, you can watch the show in its entirety on our website at fedgovtoday.com. Don't miss FedGov Today every Sunday morning at 1030 on ABC7 in the D.C. area or on the FedGov Today YouTube channel. I'm Francis Rose. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.